Hi, and welcome back to Scotty's Tech.info. I'm Scotty with my co-host Cletus. And this video is about Meltdown and Spectre, which you have no doubt uh, heard about. Meltdown and Spectre are uh, these new super duper crazy evil uh, exploits. Uh, so first of all, what actually makes Meltdown and Spectre different from exploits in the past? Well, in short, Typically, like an exploit, you get like malware, like ransomware or something. And what it usually is is something like, oh, there's like a hole in Windows or something. So some evil person writes a chunk of code. That chunk of code takes advantage of the hole, and it uh, kind of at a higher level in 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 uh, on top of something that runs on top of the operating system. It does evil things like steal your credit card number, steal your crypto private keys, or you know whatever. Meltdown and Spectre are kind of a big deal because they are literally flaws in the actual silicon of the in the actual microprocessor hardware inside the actual chip that runs your computer, your smartphone, your tablet, and so on. So these are much more low-level exploits. Um, there's been a lot of information, uh, well, a lot of news rather, but there has been kind of this dearth of actual information, and part of the reason for this is that the actual exploits, Meltdown and Spectre, are like insanely complicated. I downloaded the papers, there are two white papers, one for Meltdown and one for Spectre, and um, I'll link to those in the description if you want to read them, but I don't recommend it unless you're a computer engineer or a computer scientist, because it's pretty heavy-duty stuff. So I downloaded them and read them, um, and actually even consulted some of my learned colleagues, because it's really, really hairy and complicated. So that's actually why you haven't been reading anything like in the news media. They're, they're not actually really giving you much detail about it. They're kind of talking in generalities. And hopefully I'll be able to explain a little bit uh, why that is, because they're really low-level, super complicated stuff. So um, I'm not going to go into a lot of technical detail, but I want to sort of give maybe more of a general idea as to what they are and how they work. Um, but still, without you know, doing a deep dive, because it's, it's nasty stuff, man. So, okay, what do Meltdown Inspector actually do? Well, as I said, it's complicated, but the short version, the short, 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 short version, is they are proofs of concept of exploits where, essentially, Meltdown Inspector allow you to read areas in memory that you're not supposed to be able to read. So, Practically speaking, what that means is, like, um, with Spectre, I could write a piece of JavaScript that, uh, say you're visiting uh, two different tabs in your browser, and the first tab is your, bank, your, your online banking, right? And the second tab is some malicious website that has Spectre JavaScript in it, okay? So what would happen is, what could happen is that this malicious website you're visiting has Spectre, and it allows... Um, that malicious code to read the memory of the entire browser process, which means it would have access to your online banking stuff that's going on. Um, other examples that other people have given are like um, reading memory that you're not supposed to be able to read means you could, for example, uh, steal people's passwords and uh, credit card numbers, bank account information, Bitcoin, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, really, the only thing you need to understand there is that typically uh, in normal operation, uh, it gets it gets kind of complicated, but but again, the short version is uh, that memory in computers is sort of compartmentalized. It's like sandboxed. So certain things are supposed to be able to access certain areas of memory, and certain other processes or applications or whatever are not allowed to access um, sort of top secret areas in memory. Because say you have your operating system running. Um, when you run, say, like Microsoft Word, it kind of talks and interacts with the operating system, but Word should not be accessing everything that's going on in your browser, for example, and vice versa. So that's kind of the, the, the short, easy, simple version. Okay, so, well, how do they actually work? Um, yeah, so you've probably heard about... Um, a lot about this out-of-order execution and speculative execution. And no one is really talking about what these are, but I think it's kind of important to give sort of a brief overview uh, because you'll have a little bit better idea of what's going on here. So 
The first thing is uh, that out-of-order execution and speculative execution and branch prediction, these are all features of modern microprocessors where the, uh, they, they, they basically make the processor much faster. They allow the processor to do things in sort of a nonlinear fashion. So let's take a, a quick look at, uh, first of all, let's look at uh, out-of-order execution. So <clears throat> basically here we have a column, and each of those blue boxes numbered 1 through 6 is uh, an instruction. Microprocessors execute instructions, and in the olden days they would execute them only sequentially, because of course if you write a program line by line, if you execute the program uh, non-sequentially, non-linearly, well then the program's going to do all kinds of wonky stuff. But the problem comes when, let's say here in our example, first you execute instruction number 1, then you do instruction number 2, and then you get to instruction number 3. Now instruction number 3 is A plus B equals something, right? You're going to take some value in A and you're going to add it to the value in B. But we notice we have a red box around B. And the reason is because the value B is not yet available to the processor. So it can't actually do the addition A plus B. So normally in the olden days what it would do is it would reach instruction number 3 and go, Oh crap, I don't have B, what do I do? It would literally just sit there, the processor would sit there and idle. It would literally do nothing until the value of B was available, and then it would execute A plus B, and then carry on to instructions 4, 5, 6, and so on. So, what out-of-order execution means in a very simplified general sense is, as we can see in the right column here, first it does instruction number 1, then it does instruction number 2. Now, you'll notice we still have instruction number 3 here, and instruction number 3 is again A plus B, but since B isn't available, it looks ahead and it says, oh, hang on a minute, what about instructions 4 and 5? Can I actually execute those ahead of time without breaking anything? And if I can, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to execute number 4 and number 5 out of order, because sometimes processors can do multiple things at once to a limited extent. So basically, while it's waiting for the value of B to become available, it's going to pre-execute number 4 and 5. Then you notice that the next step is, is uh, instruction number 3, and you can do A plus B, because now it has a green box around it, because the value of B is available. So, Bob's your uncle, you can do step 1, step 2, oh crap, I can't do step 3, so in the meantime, let me execute steps 4 and 5, because it's safe to do that out of order. Then I'll finally execute step 3, since B is available, and then I'll move on down the line to 6, 7, 8, and so on down the line. Okay, so that's a very simple example of, uh, overly simplified actually, of what out-of-order execution is. So hopefully now you understand, okay, what the heck are they talking about there? That's a feature of pretty much all modern processors, and that's a reason why they're so performant and fast. Uh, substantially faster than older processors. And these uh, these features have been around since uh, 1995, so yeah, we're talking like uh, over 20 years ago, uh, and that's why uh, these Meltdown and Spectre actually affect so many processors. So, what is speculative execution? Speculative execution works like this. You have uh, a line of instructions again. First you do number one, then you do number two, but you notice number three is an if statement. And it says, if x is greater than 5, then I'm going to do one thing, and if it's not, I'm going to do the other. So the, the steps, the instructions 4 and 5, uh, which, which versions of that they execute is going to depend on the value of x. So here in our little diagram, if x is greater than 5, I'm going to execute uh, instructions 4 and 5 in the green box. But if x is less than 5, I'm going to execute instructions 4 and 5 in the red box. And once that's done, I'm going to carry on with 6, 7, 8, and so on down the line. Okay, so that's speculative execution. The processor tries to guess what's going to happen, and <clears throat> this is where the, the term branch prediction comes in, because you have you know, two or more possible uh, results, like the, 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 the code that the processor is executing could branch in one of several possible directions, and, the, and the, the processor itself is going to try to guess which of those is coming in the future and sort of pre-execute it. If it's right, the whole processor runs faster. If, it, if it's wrong, it just kind of throws everything away. <clears throat> okay, so this is important because both Meltdown and Spectre, they're very similar exploits, but they work in a slightly different way. Uh, Meltdown is a little bit more complicated, so I'm going to talk mostly about Spectre, but um, 
there are several ways, there are sort of several variants of the Spectre exploit, but uh, one of them involves essentially you write a piece of malware, okay, and that malware, what it's going to do is it's going to use this speculative execution in such a way that the malware will train your processor to prefer a certain branch, possibly a branch that doesn't even exist. And in that branch is going to be sort of the payload of your malware, the thing that does the super evil, that reads memory that it's not supposed to, more or less. So basically what these exploits are doing is they're using performance features of the processor in a way that they were never designed to be used. Along with uh, a second mini exploit, there's kind of two parts to each of these exploits. There's the the out of order execution or speculative execution flaw, let's say, and the second part is they're calling it uh, cache side loading, which is cache memory is cache cache is basically memory in the processor that is uh, very it's a, it's a small amount of memory, but it's very fast and it's on the processor and the processor uses it to store data. And as I mentioned before, like you're not supposed to be able to access data in this cache memory, like, you know, they're like, sort of like permissions, you can think of it. And so not all memory, not all operations can access all memory because things are compartmentalized. So using this sort of, each of Meltdown Inspector is sort of like a two part thing where the first part is taking advantage of like speculative execution. And the second part is this cache side loading problem, which is actually related to timing. Uh, so you may have heard that Firefox released a fix and they reduced the, the accuracy of their precision timers, right? That's because this cache part of each of these flaws has to do with timing. And I'm not even going to touch that with a 10 foot pole because like it's seriously hairy. Um, but that at least gives you a general idea of what's going on here. So, um, right. So Spectre basically, um, fools your processor into into speculatively executing something that it shouldn't execute and that's where the malware kind of gets in and then this little cache trick that's the second part of it and bam you can read memory that you're not supposed to read <sighs> okay well how to protect yourself I know there's a lot of kind of hype and everything and um, but the bottom line is that with meltdown um, meltdown is basically already patched these exploits were supposed to be released on January 9th. There was sort of a, everyone was sort of working on it like in, it was like all top secret and January 9th was supposed to be the, the big day when they were unveiled. Uh, and somehow, I, I couldn't determine why exactly, but somehow they were leaked ahead of time on January 3rd. Now that same day that this Meltdown Inspector, these two white papers were published, the same day, Microsoft released Meltdown patches for Windows 10. Um, I already have them on my computer. Chances are, if you are running Windows 10 or Mac OS or uh, Linux, pretty much no matter what you're running, Google has released patches for Android, blah, blah, blah. If you're running uh, any modern operating system and you allow the software updates to come through, chances are you have them already. And if you don't, um, you'll get them, like, probably within two hours. So Meltdown actually is essentially already patched. Now, um, one little side note, Meltdown is actually patched because of another vulnerability in microprocessors um, related to address-based layout randomization. And that's a, a, a little thing you probably, you may have heard about that, and that's basically, more or less, it's a feature where if the core of the operating system is stuck in memory in your computer, and the sort of like the files of of that the kernel the core is put in the same place all the time then malware can see where stuff is so address space layout randomization does exactly what it sounds like it sort of scrambles where things are so like every time you reboot your computer the core of the operating system when it's put in memory is going to be sort of like scrambled around so that malware can't find the different parts of it and do evil things that's an, a kind of an older security feature that was sort of broken so the fix for that is to sort of randomize these locations even more. And it turns out that that fix also fixes Meltdown. Now, if you read the Meltdown paper carefully, there is a side note that basically says, yeah, okay, the current patches for Meltdown, they're good, but there's this one kind of corner case involving like pointers and stuff and blah, 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 and it gets all hairy again. Um, but it sounds to me, I'm not, ter I'm not totally sure, but it sounds like Meltdown is basically patched like say 98 or 99%. There's like this one tiny like percent left where maybe okay, 
there there may be something that can slip through, but it's not very likely because it's already a very complicated exploit. Both Meltdown and and Spectre are extremely difficult to implement. Um, so yeah, you basically just update your devices and you'll be able to protect yourself. Patches for um, Spectre are coming very, very soon. So you probably also have heard that uh, there will be performance a performance hit. I'm reading a lot about like, oh my god, my computer's going to slow down by 30%. Well, no, not really. Because as I mentioned, I already have the patches for Windows 10 on my computer, and so do you probably. And have you noticed that your computer has slowed down a lot lately? Probably not. And it's also uh, sort of logical to assume that if suddenly everyone's computers or servers become like 20% slower, everyone's going to throw a fit. And naturally, companies like Microsoft and Apple and, you know, everybody's going to be aware of all this because their stuff is also going to slow down and they're going to go, oh, crap, yeah, we better get another fix out for that. And in fact, various companies have announced already, like, yeah, basically, don't worry about it. We know that some people will have a few problems with this. We're going to be working on and sort of developing further fixes in the future that might fix any performance issues. So, um, yeah, so far it hasn't really slowed anything down uh, appreciably, and um, I think most of that so far has been kind of like, oh my god, the sky is falling, we're all going to die kind of stuff. Um, yeah, the sky hasn't fallen yet, and we're not dead yet, so. Um, okay, so... The thing is with these exploits is that they are proofs of concept, and this is kind of a key point. When you actually read about Meltdown Inspector, um, they are very difficult to implement. They're very low-level hacks. So what that means is it's like it's like Meltdown Inspector are like a, a power tool for doing evil stuff, right? But it's like if you want to build a house you've got your power tool. Say it's like a power screwdriver. That's Spectre, right? Well, you can't build a whole house with just a power screwdriver. It may be a really awesome power screwdriver. It may be like a totally like low-level hardware bug-related super power screwdriver, man, right? But with just that power screwdriver, you can't do anything. For example, with Meltdown, Meltdown can actually read all the physical memory of your computer, whereas Spectre is sort of limited to like a single process or a single chunk of memory. So whereas Meltdown allows one to read all the memory in, in a machine, more or less, Spectre is sort of like targeted to, like say, like a specific application, like a specific browser process, and it can convince that process to leak some memory that it shouldn't leak, right? The thing with Meltdown, though, is that, sure, it can access all the memory, but number one, it's already patched. And number two, the white paper actually says point blank that the fastest they can read data so far is 500 kilobytes per second. So if you wanted to look in, say, 8 gigs of memory on a computer, and you can only read it at 500k per second, it's going to take Meltdown 4.4 hours to read that whole 8 gigs. And just reading the memory isn't enough, because you have to actually know what you're looking for. When you have, like, a hack, the ability to read memory that you shouldn't be able to read, you don't know what's there. You, you have to actually incorporate other tools and other knowledge about where data is stored, and, you know, you can't just... It's not like it's 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 not like Meltdown or Spectre are like search functions that lets a person you know that lets a bad guy just go, give me Billy Bob's password, go, and it just knows exactly where to look. This is like I said, it's a very low level thing. So you're not even getting a password; you're getting basically chunks of memory, and multiple chunks of memory might form a password. So yes, it's kind of a nasty exploit. Both of them are kind of nasty, but in and of themselves they're they're just kind of like one power tool that you would use to make an epically large epically evil piece of malware so yeah that's uh that's kind of the, the that's the deal um i have to say that uh as a technical kind of guy both meltdown and specter are very very cool and part of the reason i think there's so much hype is because technically speaking they are really really nifty they are incredibly complex and mostly they're insanely clever the way they do things so that's kind of why people are so excited about it uh, as for the the ability their their abilities to cause harm to people uh yes that's we know what they do but as i said it's like someone could take these and try to do something seriously evil with them they are a big deal 
Uh, you cannot just simply go around and replace every microprocessor in the whole world because that's not economically feasible. Uh, so they're patching software in various ways. And um, those patches are going to improve over time. And um, yeah, I think, I think we're going to, I think we'll live. So that's pretty much the scoop on that. Um, so yeah, don't poop your pants just yet. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> so um, I'll put some links in the description to papers and other good stuff. Uh, for more techie tips, see scottystech.info. Thanks for watching. See you next time.